Welcome back to the Dry Fasting Club. I'm Yannick Wolf, and today we're going to be talking about the science behind how a five-day dry fast is safe for healthy individuals. Yes, I know you might be saying things like, whoa, 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 five days safe? There's no way. And if you're like most people, you've grown up being told that you can't go longer than three days without water. This is not just one study. These are two separate studies on two different occasions tracking people doing a five-day dry fast. It's amazing. And yes, it most likely is going to shake your belief system to its core. But let's say you've already gone past that initial shock factor. And now you're thinking, okay, maybe five days is possible. What about longer than five days? That's a topic for another discussion, but let's dive into these two papers. So the first paper is called Dry Fasting Physiology, Responses to Hypovolemia and Hypertonicity. And I touched on this topic in a very recent video that talked about hypertonic stress. And you just have to remember that hypovolemia is a state that starts when you when the water gets lowered in the body, but hypertonicity is a state that occurs the deeper you get into a dry fast. So the more the body dehydrates, the more the hypertonic stress actually starts to play a role. The conclusion of this study, so the study talked about the three main risks that you find in a dry fast, and that's blood hypertonicity, hypovolemia, and hypoglycemia, which is low blood sugar. But the study concludes that even though there are these risks, after these five days of tracking the dry fasters, they demonstrated normal blood pressure, normal heart rate, normal hemoglobin oxygen saturations, and safe values in serum creatinine, urea, potassium, sodium, and glucose. And the craziest thing was a substantial increase in glomerular filtration rate. Yes, you heard that correctly. It looks like the kidney function improved during and after a dry fast. That's pretty wild because kidney issues and worries about kidney disease is one of the biggest reasons why a lot of people are terrified of dry fasting. Hopefully, the study shows you that the body is insanely complex and powerful and has mechanisms to protect itself in a dehydrated state. But let's jump into a few things we need, should keep in mind from this paper, like a few things that really stand out. Okay, so one of the most important things that this paper showed us is something that we sort of knew from piecing together information over the years. Sort of the way philosophers understood the universe with extremely simple tools back in the ancient Greek days, which is mind-blowing. But we sort of knew that sodium levels uh, go up and potassium levels go down. And in this paper, we actually see it here. We see that there is a divergence that occurs around day two. So once we start passing day two, they start splitting. We could say that the divergence occurs around day three and link that towards the acidotic crisis and make some correlations there. But this is one of the reasons why after a dry fast, we know that we should stay away from sodium as much as we can. But we do still want to pump the other electrolytes and specifically potassium. It looks like the body uses more potassium to balance the acidity in the body. So it's pulling it out of our body's reserves. And a lot of times that's from our bones. Why does the body hold on to the sodium during this dry fast? Well, it's because of an upregulation of aldosterone, which is a hormone that goes up drastically during a dry fast and makes it so that our body really clings on to sodium. And that effect continues after the dry fast as the body slowly comes back. You've got to give it a few days to come back into homeostasis. You'll notice that I really stress, specifically in the Scorch Protocol and other of the uh, protocols on the Dry Fasting Club website, that you're really going to want to top up on magnesium and potassium, as well as vitamin C and vitamin B. And I'll talk about them more in a little bit. But what does all of this mean when we're talking about the electrolyte levels diverging and how they affect our body? What does it mean when you want to prepare for a dry fast? Well, if you're coming from a low-carb diet, 
you're already adapted to a slightly lower electrolyte state in the body. And your body's most likely already in a bit of a sodium retention phase. That means that you're not going to have these wild swings. And the dry fast experience is going to be milder for you. And that's kind of why we see so many people coming from low carb diets having a lot more positive experiences with dry fasting. But if you're coming from a high carb preparation, so your diet is high in carbs, and this could be plant-based or just a standard American diet, you're going to struggle a little, a little bit more as your body tries to switch over into that fat adaptation, that fat burning. And you're really going to feel those effects during the first few days until you get through that barrier. But a higher carb prep also means that you're more stocked up on water and electrolytes in the body, which translates to having a safer and better time going into those really long dry fasts, which we're not really going to be talking about today. So we know cortisol spikes on a dry fast the longer we continue. Here we get to see that it actually really starts to spike around day four. And here we can make another correlation once we pass that three-day acidotic crisis mark. But we're not going to go too deep into cortisol. I want to talk about uric acid and vitamin C. We see that these are both antioxidants. And this study showed us what happens during a dry fast. Obviously, vitamin C is water soluble. So we are not taking in vitamin C, then the levels are going to drop. What happens if our antioxidant vitamin C levels go extremely low? Normally, well, you get scurvy. And most of us have heard about scurvy where your teeth fall out and it usually had to do with sailors coming across uh, the ocean to colonize North America. But in the case of a dry fast, the body has these mechanisms where as the vitamin C goes down, it upregulates the other antioxidants. So we see the TAC levels, the total antioxidant capacity in the blood, go up like crazy. And those are things like glutathione, vitamin E, and uric acid. And specifically, in this case, they tracked uric acid as the one that goes up the most. There's a sort of inverse correlation that you see in the wild as well with animals, where during times of low vitamin C, the uric acid goes up in the blood and vice versa. This is the way our body maintains homeostasis and keeps us in a good, safe level. What does this tell us? Basically, it shows us that a dry fast, even though we're losing the antioxidant vitamin C, still bathes our blood and our whole system in antioxidants. And I kind of see it like an antioxidant bath. And I'm sure that that plays a very important role in a lot of the healing benefits of a dry fast. But uh, people with gout start to panic when they hear uric acid. And there's a lot of connection to people starting a ketogenic diet and getting gout flare-ups. But if you drastically increase your ketosis in the body and are able to get through a gout flare-up, a lot of people have found that going through fasting or severe ketosis has actually been able to help put their gout into remission. In the beginning, it's tough because ketones and uric acid both compete for excretion from the body, but once the body adapts to that, it's smooth sailing from then on. So with the vitamin C, what do we want to think about with a dry fast? Well, we want to top up on vitamin C and we want to take it after the dry fast as well. Because it's water soluble, it makes sense that vitamin B is going to be very similar. We don't actually store it in our fat cells like all the other ones. But now let's move on to erythropoietin, EPO levels. What's crazy out of this study is that they showed us that the EPO levels dropped during a dry fast. Normally, we would assume that they would go up because a dry fast promotes these conditions that normally would make your EPO levels go up, such as more growth hormone factor and having a lower blood volume. When the blood volume goes down, the body produces more EPO. What is EPO? It's a hormone produced in your kidneys that basically stimulates the growth of red blood cells. And a lot of people or athletes use these strategies to increase their EPO levels so that they have an unfair advantage versus 
others, and it's actually a banned substance by the World Anti-Doping Committee. But what the study found, which was crazy, was that the EPO levels decreased on a dry fast. It didn't really make sense, and the only theory and logical conclusion was that the dry fast was oxygenating the blood so much that it was countering all of these other factors that we would have assumed would have made it go up. And that means that the oxygenation effect of a dry fast is so powerful, it might even be more powerful than hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and that is wild. And if you don't believe me, just wear one of those fitness trackers on your next extended dry fast and watch the oxygen saturation go up. And as a side note, or as a side bonus, watch your HRV levels go up as well, which correlate to your parasympathetic and heart health, and use them as a motivator to continue during those really tough moments. Now let's quickly jump into paper two, and this one was called Anthropometric Hemodynamic Metabolic and Renal Responses During Five Days of Food and Water Deprivation. And I think we just go straight to the conclusion on this one. The intervention of five food and water deprivation days in 10 healthy adults was found to be safe, decreased weight, and all measured circumferences and improved renal function considerably. Amazing. So this paper tracked more of blood pressure, heart rate, oxygen saturation, and tracked a few electrolyte levels uh, in the blood, as opposed to the other one that actually tracked electrolyte levels through the urine. It was a pretty bold and to-the-point statement that this paper made that a dry fast of five days is basically safe all around. Even though they didn't measure too many things, they focused on some important metrics like blood pressure, heart rate, and oxygen saturation. And we can see here from the results that the numbers improve for everything. We see the systolic blood pressure, the diastolic blood pressure all stabilize and remain stable days after the fast as well, which is amazing. And we can actually see that the blood pressure dropped during the fast to better levels and then continued at those levels. Then you see heart rate, which is the only thing that actually jumped a little bit afterwards. And potentially this has to do with the body trying to regulate after this intense stressor. And then we see oxygen saturation improve on the fast and continue to maintain that improvement after the fast as well. And this is a huge thing for a lot of people dealing with a lot of chronic illnesses that have a basis in ischemic diseases, which is problems with the blood. And oxygenation is correlated to microclots and a lot of other problems with the blood. So when it comes to blood diseases, dry fasting is fantastic and just fasting in general. Now, when we look at serum electrolyte levels, we see similarities to the other paper, but that one we actually tracked what the body was excreting. So this one actually tracked the levels during the fast in the blood, and it showed that the body is able to maintain levels, even of potassium. If you remember in the previous paper, potassium levels kept going up, which means that our body was dropping more potassium. But in this paper, you can actually see that the body was able to stabilize its blood levels of potassium. So we don't have to worry about that during a fast. The body is in homeostasis, but it is doing this at a big cost to its potassium stores. Whereas the sodium levels slightly rose because we already know aldosterone is holding on to them and as we get more dehydrated that salt level becomes more and more concentrated and this is another indicator why we want to stay away from sodium for at least a few days after a dry fast what's interesting here though is we see urea levels going up and we know that urea comes from protein catabolism. And what is really interesting is that urea is actually an osmolite. And if you followed my osmolite protocol and osmolite discussions, you know that those are very necessary in hypertonic states to keep cells functioning correctly. Another very interesting thing that we can pull from this paper is the glucose levels. And you can see here that the blood glucose goes down for about two days, and on the third day, it starts to spike back up. What does this mean? Well, we have that keto flu, and you know the first three days are the hardest parts of the dry fast. This is because we're not ingesting any 
glucose, any carbs. So our body is using up what's left in our stores and it's transitioning to fat burning. And this transition is why we struggle so hard. And you can see that once we get to that day three, that magical number, suddenly our glucose levels go up. And that is from burning our triglycerides, our fats, turning them into glycogen and fatty acids so that they can later be turned into ketones and glucose. What does this tell us? Well, you just have to get through that tough spot to really start cruising. And finally, let's touch on the creatinine levels and creatinine clearance. This is why the paper concluded that renal function improved. So our kidneys were actually clearing creatinine at such a beautiful and high rate. And this was actually tough to understand because logically we'd assume that if we are getting dehydrated, our kidneys are probably going to struggle. I mean, we use water to create urine and to pee things out, right? Well, the theory here is that this increasing osmotic gradient between the tissue fluid and the blood keeps going up and pulls water out of the kidneys and into the blood. And what this does is it helps the kidneys get decongested in a way. Because as we get older and sicker, our kidney function goes down. You can think of it like slime and grime in between our cells. And we really don't have a method of cleaning that out. But when you bring in this crazy dehydrated stress and you start pulling on those cells and pulling the water out, with it comes a lot of the gunk. So this could actually be a way to improve renal microcirculation and increase the glomerular filtration rate. And it was amazing because it's kind of like a beautiful kidney detox. That's basically it for the two papers. I think those are some of the main topics that I wanted to cover and to show you that a five-day dry fast is not impossible. In fact, it seems to have a lot of benefits. But you do have to keep in mind that everybody is different and that these studies were done on healthy individuals. So when you start bringing in different illnesses into the mix, you should do a lot more research and take things a lot more carefully. Personally, I believe that fasting is our strongest tool for health, and in certain situations, you just have to adapt. And if you're in a situation where it may be dangerous to go for longer extended ones, you can start with shorter ones. As always, your health is a journey. Dry fasting is not a sprint, it's a marathon. And until next time, good luck on your dry fasting journey. Thanks for sticking around. If you liked the video, leave a comment and share your ideas. And if you're looking for very detailed and unique protocols, check out the dryfastingclub.com. You'll find a lot there. You can even book a quick chat with me. There's also a free Discord link that you can find on the site. And I highly recommend you check out the forums and share your insights and experiences about dry fasting. Uh, you can kind of treat it like accountability, but really you can help a lot of other people. And as always, remember, no two people are the same, so every fasting experience is unique. Good luck on your dry fasting journey.